Welcome to Weird Web Radio, an explorer's guide to hidden worlds of the paranormal and occult, reality-expanding experiences, and the downright weird and bizarre. With your host, Lonnie Scott. Hey gang, welcome to Weird Web Radio and the Season 5 Finale. I cannot believe it's already been five years of entertaining all of you and hopefully bringing you the best insight in the paranormal and the occult with all of my amazing guests. And I'm really excited to introduce you to the guests that we're going to have today. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Luxa Strata. Luxa is a magician, creator, and host of the Lux Occult podcast. It's a show that focuses on the intersections between magic, art, philosophy, and science as viewed through the context of chaos magic practice and co-host of Ad Hoc History and Smuts Up. <laughs> a really great name for a podcast. Lux is also the architect of the Green Mushroom Hypho Sigil Project. I don't know why I get tongue-tied saying that. Uh, that project is a large-scale, ongoing group working focused on building connections, fostering creativity, empowering individuals to become more agentic, as it says through here, uh, through the use of magic and esoteric technology, as well as to resist through integrity, responsibility, respect, and reciprocity. I have done a lot of research into the Green Mushroom Project since hearing about Luxa for the first time and then having a chance to talk to her, and I can't recommend all you magical people getting involved enough. It is a mind-blowingly amazing project. I'm part of it. I'm asking you to come join in, too. In addition to her work with the Green Mushroom, her current focus in her personal practice is on self-remediation and restoration, as well as enriching everyday life with practices focused on food, trance, eroticism, sound, and visual art. Lux is also an enthusiastic about her continuing devotional work with Goddess in several of her iterative forms. And you're going to hear a little bit about that in the show. You can find Luxa, of course, on the Luxa Cult podcast. She's on Instagram. She's got the uh, Mimetic Disease page on Instagram. Ad Hoc History, what she does with her brother. And, of course, the Green Mushroom Project. So please check all that out. I want to thank you all again for being fans of the show and listening as long as you have. Welcome to the Season 5 finale. I look forward to many more years with you. Stay weird, my friends. And we are recording. Lux Estrada, welcome to Weird Web Radio. I'm really excited to have you here. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Well, I'm glad the feeling's mutual. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, for folks that just tuned in, you, you've heard me go through some of the background information of what Luxa does, the different shows that she's on and produces and so on. Um, one thing that makes me really curious about other practitioners of the occult arts as they were is why why pick up something with no promises of results lots of i don't know if this worked like why 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 pick it up at all hmm it's an interesting question a good question <laughs> and i'm sure one that is different for every practitioner maybe i think that for me a lot of it is curiosity um, it's one thing I say in my show a lot is like, stay curious. Um, mm -hmm. I just like to, I don't know, I like to do weird shit and see what happens, I guess. <laughs> but there's also this sort of idea of, um, you know, this kind of I idea of like finding one's own like personal authenticity, if that's a thing, or like this sort of like idea of what does like freedom and agency look like what does that feel like you know in our modern context and everything and um, where does that balance between the individual and the culture and things like that I think I probably would say like I practice because I have to <laughs> do <laughs> it's just sort of a part of who I am and so I don't know um yeah, I, I don't know. I was joking around with a friend of mine earlier today about like, you know, one of the reasons I do so much magic is because I need so much fucking help. <laughs> like, so I don't know. There could be something like that, too. <laughs> like, I think you figured out the greatest title for a magical book ever and do weird shit and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. 
Okay. <laughs> I do think it's just so interesting to, to look at how things kind of fit together um, and how they intersect. I talk about it on my show a lot, the sort of like idea of the intersections of, you know, art and magic and science and philosophy and how chaos magic is like a really good way to contextualize all those things together. Okay. I, I got my start. I guess my serious start with chaos magic way back in the nineties. And it was all about being results driven that attracted me so much to it. There wasn't, there wasn't anything where they were going to leave it to some ambiguous. Well, maybe it worked, maybe it didn't it in chaos magic. It works or it doesn't. And I kind of really dig that attitude. I always have. It's been my foundation, my practice since I was 17 years old, which was a lot longer ago than I care to admit now. And (laughs) chaos magic has kind of grown up a little bit over the years. I think from what it was back in the nineties, it's it's definitely had different voices contribute along the way. What about chaos magic attracts you to it yourself? Well, I think that for me, the approach sort of like as you were saying the approach itself is what's attractive to me uh the idea that you don't need to rely on some kind of amorphous thing you can trust in the results that you see i have a background in in biology and so this idea of like incorporating somewhat of like scientific method or scientific thought into one's practice or other areas of one's life because it is a a really good tool set for finding out if things are the case or not. I, I don't want to say true because that's a whole nother thing, but mm-hmm. the idea that like you can apply these different tools to discover things is something that I really like too. It, it's a, a sort of like mode of thought that's a little bit, I'm not sure if grounded is the right word, but a little bit more easy for somebody like me that has a sort of like scientific understanding of things so to translate into their own minds okay so with that attitude i guess when did you when did you convince yourself i guess or have an experience that tells you that magic is real how'd that go down i think the first experience that i had was when I was a kid I did start playing with what people call I mean traditional witchcraft or whatever when I was I think maybe around 11 or 12 Um, I got my hands on like Paul Hewson's mastering witchcraft and sort of went from there and um Hmm. so I think that for me yeah it was definitely early and I think it was a situation I, this is kind of personal so I don't know how much I want to say but it was a situation with with my parents and um yes it was a bad situation and I was able to uh discover that there was this agency that um I had that I could use if I wanted to and that was a really um interesting and important and also I mean I guess kind of scary thing in a way too like I mean in some, in some ways, it's still kind of scary to think about. In ge- like, if you really, it, there can be a little of like existential dread. I think when when we step back and sort of like look at the big picture with all this stuff. Um, so yes, that's definitely continued. Okay, uh, I started. Whew, I had a similar kind of yeah. This is about uh, I need to protect myself from something bad that that launched my path into magic without any shadow of a doubt that this shit is real and in fact it got harder to be sure it was real as time went on it's almost as if i don't know sometimes if 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 your magic comes out of first as this expression of desperate need for something to feel safe i guess do you think that sort of shapes the pursuit of magic for a while colors the way you want to learn and experience it? Yeah. I mean, I think that a lot of people do come to the practice because they feel like things are out of control or they lack agency in some ways in their life. So I think that that's definitely was the case for me at first. I mean, it's hard to say though. I mean, I definitely was raised in a very non-traditional, maybe non-religious context. My brother and I were sent to a kind of occulty type school. So maybe there was always some of that 
kind of stuff in the background. Um, totally lost my train of thought. <laughs> I know. That was a good thinking face. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about what's in a culty school. What is that like? I've, I've never heard anyone say that before. Well, is the school called the Waldorf School? It's based on the uh, like kind of philosophy of this dude named Rudolf Steiner, who was an occultist. He was also like not the best, in my opinion. Like you know, reading a lot of his stuff, you'll find a lot of nasty stuff. Like uh, like many of the things from that time, you will find a lot of like really kind of gross ideas about. Uh, people of different heritages and why people look different ways and like just like just really stupid bullshit like that um but, but yes that that i mean and i don't know how much of that like actually i don't remember like hearing anything like that as a kid or anything but i'm sure that you know everything is connected so uh, there's there's been several criticisms raised um of of the Waldorf school and stuff i can say that my personal experience with it was positive, but I can definitely understand why uh, there could be some like problematic stuff that's worth examining for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, reflecting back on your earliest times as a magic using kid, I guess, and, and maybe the first few years of that experience, what do you think, if you think, you know, reflect back on that would be your most important takeaway? Don't listen to what people tell you. <laughs> listen no to yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that that's, I think that that's what it is learning to actually trust your experience. And this is something I'm still working on. I think everybody sort of is in some ways or another, like learning to trust your experience um, rather than some kind of outside authority. You know, we're so conditioned to, you know, put our faith in authority. I mean, really, so we're living in a society. This is necessary in some cases, you know, even in school, uh, the idea is to sort of like, you know, there's this authority figure telling you what is true, what's the case, you know, here, learn this thing. And then to make sure you learned it, tell it back to me. So you know, there's this kind of thing where like, we're really trained to like rely on these outside sources of what's real for us. And I think that a big part of effective magic use can be about getting away from that and really trusting in your own experience. I like that. It's a, it's a nice way to say it. And I think trusting your own experience is probably one of the greatest challenges. Those of us who, you know, practice magic, sorcery, witchcraft, whatever they want to call it, uh, often have to deal with. So how, how does that take shape for you? How, how do you, trust your own experience what what's the breakdown mentally emotionally like how do you test yourself you know your experience so you know it's real well i think that there's a there's several ways i think that this occurs the first one being like the idea as you mentioned earlier of like results based stuff <laughs> you know I, I can tell whether or not something i ordered off the menu has been delivered <laughs> as to so to speak right um, <laughs> There's a, and I think that there's also a sort of a give and take um, in terms of like verification of one's own experience. It is something that I've asked for, um, and I recently I asked it of the author the main authority figure that I'm working with right now is you know the the deity that I'm worshiping. Um, I'm kind of new to deity work. I've only been doing it for like a couple years, so I, I, it's it's very strange. It's very interesting, um, and I'm, I'm liking it so far. Um, but like just asking for verification, like, are you getting this? Like, am I doing this right? Like, give me a sign, please, you know, and, and having that come back um, in a clear way that I could understand, you know, a clear symbolic language for me um, and really saying, yes, I, I asked for a sign and here it fucking is clear as day. Right. And <laughs> that's, you know, I, I guess and maybe maybe I'm contradicting myself, actually. Maybe that's not trusting my experience. Maybe that's asking for confirmation. So, yes, I, I guess I'm still working on it, really. <laughs> yeah, we probably all are. Uh, you mentioned that you're, you've you come new, I guess, to deity work recently. Um, what I two part question for you. Why avoid it in the beginning and what changed to bring you to it now? Well, I'm not sure that I ever avoided it per se. It just wasn't like interesting to me. Like this sort of concept of a personified 
like power just didn't like add up to me maybe so like it's possible that's become it's possible that's because i'm like a little bit asocial and this (laughs) sort of concept of like this i don't know person or whatever it is right it just didn't track like i thought about deities in terms of like uh, energy patterns or you know other concepts that you know from a chaos magic standpoint might be like things like in the energy model or the information model or whatever the psychological model not necessarily thinking that there are these actual entities out there um but for a few different reasons i decided it would be interesting to play in that territory for a little while and see if i could get my mind to go to places it hadn't really gone before in terms of that stuff so um yes i started working with the love and war goddess a couple of years ago after um, an intense uh, experience led me to (laughs) believe that that was the proper course of action um and yeah i found it to be really really interesting really rewarding okay does the love and war goddess have a name uh, there's lots of names. I, again, this is a little bit, I'm still thinking about things pretty abstractly. Um, the kind of concept of this, you know, this goddess, I think, shows up a lot of different places and in a lot of different forms. Um, in some ways, I think that you could contextualize it. And this obviously shows up in a lot of different traditions, but like contextualizing it as a sort of main generative energy that's kind of... Uh, maybe filtered iteratively like maybe in sort of like a fractal way into these different um configurations of how this power is interfaced with with us humans so i think that this idea of this like love and war goddess is definitely one of them i think we see her show up a lot of places we've got like ishtar and anana and then you know venus earlier on you know was also a goddess of war um, before it was a little bit more um I, I think I said before they took her weapons away. <laughs> um, but, uh, and so this, yeah, this idea is sort of like, you know, and it's changed for me too. And um, I'm also, I've, I think within the last maybe almost a year or so, um, Hecate came through like really, really clear. And it was something that I just couldn't ignore. And so, um, yes, we are we're quite close now too. So, yes. Awesome. No, I, I like it when people find themselves suddenly confronted with maybe these things are real, whatever those things happen to be. And and I'm always curious about the experience of why and how that happens. Yeah. And, I mean, like, I don't know what it is, but it's definitely fucking something. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and exactly where they reside in the, the well, what we call the field. I've, I've stolen that gleefully from Aiden and, <laughs> and I forevermore will refer to it that way. I like it. It, it tracks It's me. always weird to me. Like, where are they exactly? You know, like, how do they reside in all those forces? Are they the same? Are they different? It's it's one of those questions or a series of questions I don't think we ever actually get a legitimate answer to. Oh, yeah, sure. I totally agree. I mean, we can see all the maps, but not the territory, right? Right. <laughs> 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 For sure. <laughs> And I mean, okay. even this question of, you know, considering these things, of are they out there or are they in here or like is to what extent is there like even a difference between those things? I don't know. It's uh, it's fun to think about because you'll never be able to say as you kind of it's a it's a journey that probably won't end. And that's a, that's kind of cool. Yeah. Be prepared to change your mind. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Um so we've got a sense of where you've come from. I'm, I want to get a picture kind of where you're at now. What What does your, your practice consist of these days? I mean, I think I do the sort of like basic things that a lot of people do. I spend time meditating and doing introspective work and journaling and stuff like that. So that's kind of a big cornerstone of it for me, just the basic kind of, um, I do, you know, basic sigil magic every day, candle magic and stuff like that. Um you might have seen my pictures of breakfast magic on Instagram where I incorporate, uh, I like to incorporate food into my practice. I have a sort of, 
I'm not sure if it's out of laziness, but I do really like efficiency. So wherever I can incorporate things together and kind of build that synergy, I like to play around with that. Okay. Yeah, I have seen the photos. I have seen how you work with food. Um, I I dig that style. I think I think in modern practice of magic, witchcraft, sorcery, like people forget the the simple acts can be some of the most profound magic you act, you know, you do with it throughout your day. And it's good to see people out there reminding others of that. Yeah, I think this came up, I believe it might have been in the conversation that you had with Jason Miller uh, recently about, you know, these kind of this idea of like these really complex rituals being there and being available for people that aren't doing this kind of daily work. Um, I listened to a lot of your episodes recently, so I hope that's the right one that it was in. <laughs> I'm sure we covered it with Jason. I like to pick on Jason. <laughs> Well, whoever, it was a great conversation, like many of the ones that you've had have been. Um, But yeah, I I thought that that tracked um, for me, you know, this idea of, well, yeah, maybe it will take a lot more to get somebody's attention if you haven't been talking to them every day or whatever. Mm -hmm. No, you're absolutely right. Um, Speaking of Jason, Jason Miller is one of my most uh, important influences and teachers that I've had over the last decade of my practice. Um, in many ways, Jason's work saved my practice. Um, who, who are those people for you? Who are the big influences? Oh man. Well, definitely Robert Anton Wilson. Um, a huge, huge impact on how I sort of contextualize truth especially from a a scientific background I think that for me a lot of like where I struggle with what could maybe be called dogmatic thinking is from that and he does such a great job um, especially in I think quantum psychology and other places too but breaking down this idea of speaking accurately because a lot of (laughs) a lot of times we make truth assertions that aren't actually knowable or known without meaning to. And I think it creates a big uh, backlog of bullshit, right? Like (laughs) of inaccuracies maybe that, you know, that can, I think, clutter one's clear view of what's actually going on. So I think, yeah, Robert Anton Wilson that for that reason and many others is a huge huge influence i mean ramsey dukes obviously sasamami is like i think one of the most beautiful pieces of writing about magic that's ever been created <laughs> um, obviously austin osmond's fair um although it's kind of hard to read it's still excellent to meditate on um i feel like i've gotten a lot out of it actually so yeah, those are, those are probably some of the big, like obvious ones. I, Carlos Castaneda, I think was a big influence for me when I was younger, like in high school and stuff. I know he's like a total fraud, but, it's like, <laughs> um, but you know, reading those books, like, you know, as a kid and sort of like right at the time when I was like discovering hallucinogenic drugs and being able to approach that um, and those kinds of substances with the sort of respect of treating it as like a teacher, I think really did helped me a lot and and my friend group as well um so yeah those are definitely some of the ones that have been big for me um there's a book called uh, chaos making a new science by james gleek um which is about uh chaos theory you know complex nonlinear dynamics that really had a big impact too when i read it because it was like oh fuck well these are the like cheat <laughs> codes of reality and it was actually much later when i'd heard about chaos magic but you know, see, like reading this book and hearing about this, you know, what all of these complex systems have in common and this idea of feedback loops and, and all of it, it, it's a total game changer. That's interesting. Yeah. You bring up books. Uh, I love books. There's books that clearly in your life. They're behind you. Uh, they're to my right, to my left. They're all over my house. Um, if you're going to give somebody in this realm of practice two one or two books that you think would be just like you can't miss these what would they be oh man well who is this person and what are their interests like in terms of like what do they want to get out of their practice 
because that's going to change the answer. Valid. Yeah, very valid. Look at you going on Meredith Gray's on me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just your general magic practitioner. Somebody wants to dip their toes in. They want to get started. You know, like what, what do you think they need to do? What books might you actually recommend to them? Okay, well, the ones that I would probably give to somebody would be, uh, I would definitely give them Six Ways by Aiden Walker. Um, and I'd probably give him Lieber Nolan Psychonaut by Peter J. Carroll. Yeah, that's interesting that you choose those two. I understand Six Ways uh, kind of covers everything in Lieber Nolan a way, though, don't you think? I think maybe, maybe. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. It's That's debatable. <laughs> They're very different. There's, I think that there's a lot of information <clears throat> crossover. There's like informational crossover in there. Um, but in terms of the style and the approach and like where it's situated and kind of like the historical context of things, totally different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Funny, Six Ways is the first book I require out of all my students. So I, I totally dig that. Lieber Knoll is the book that like set me on this path all these years ago. Um, yeah, I, I, I can see how people get thing, different things out of them. I'm, it was interesting when Six Ways came out for me. Um, I was at a point in my practice where I was actually just overhauling everything I did. And it's like Aiden's book landed in my lap at the time when I needed someone to remind me I didn't need to overhaul it. I just needed to like bring what was best about what I was already doing together rather than trying to shed all that skin and figure out what direction I was going next in, in a strange way. But that's what it did for me. Oh yeah. Yeah. I really can't say enough good things about Aiden and his approach and how uh, incredibly eloquent and good he is at explaining these kinds of things, which are very sometimes difficult to explain. Yeah. Aiden Walker, always on weird web radio, even when he's not here. <laughs> even when he's not here. He's here. <laughs> always. I love you, man. I know you're listening and you know, I love you. <laughs> it's kind of the same on my show too. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Aiden. Yeah, right. I know he's listening. <laughs> he helped put this thing together, you and I. <laughs> I know. Yes. I, yeah. Hell yeah. All right. So, uh, one cool thing that you do on your show, I, I I enjoy so much as I listen to you know to all your episodes is when you do the um, bibliomancy. And you're like, hey, have you got a ten sided die? <laughs> you <know? laughs> you're like, so. It, it, it sounds to me like a pretty unique way of going about. You're not just grabbing a book and going to a page, and pointing at a paragraph or a word or a sentence. How how did you come up with this system? In fact, how does it work? Oh, sure. Well, actually, the what you just said is kind of the nuts and bolts of it. Yeah. But in order to find out what book that's going to be, the bibliomancy roll tables are used. So for the first year of the show, it was two tables of twelve. So you'd flip a coin and then roll the twelve sided die. And, you know, depending on if it was heads or tails, it would be like, you know, table A or table B. And then you'd roll the the die to see which book would be uh, the one we were going to consult. For the second year of the show, I have revised it. So now it is a eight-sided die and a four-sided die. Um, so there's eight tables of four items to select from. Gotcha. Yeah, and you just keep a stack of these books next to you while you're doing the show, just in case. Um, <laughs> I have a book collection. I usually make people wait a second while I go grab it off the show. <laughs> oh, nice. Because <laughs> that would be like 36 books. Like, I mean, I am surrounded by books. But <laughs> Same. <laughs> do you want me to read for you? I'd be happy to. Oh, you want to do some? Let's do it. You want to take a bibliomancy break? Sure. I'm happy to do it. Let's okay. do a bibliomancy break. Oh, yeah. Uh, Weird Web Radio exclusive. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, let me pull up the tables here. Oh, I don't have... I have six-sided die. That's all I have. That is okay. I have an eight-sided die and a four-sided die here. Yeah. I've got a ton of tarot cards, runes, and six-sided die. <laughs> <laughs> It's funny. I I love the little quick divination system in Don Webb's Uncle Setnock's um, guide to whatever. I can't think of the name of the book now, but he's got this whole roll of six sided die, and here's a preset answer for you. And there's just it's just fun. I love that. Yeah, hell yeah. 
Okay. Do you have a question? Do I have a question? Yeah, I have got a question. So I was trucking along writing my book that I was under contract with for Llewellyn uh, until I caught COVID in November of last year. And since I recovered from COVID, which took an extra long time, unfortunately, I have not found my ability to focus and write that book anymore. Despite every effort, all the tips and tricks that are out there, I can't seem to find it again in to come out of me. So how do I remove that block? Okay. Excellent question here. All right. I'm going to go ahead and roll these die here and we'll see what we get. All right. So we have table two, item three. It's going to be from the book of the law. By oh, shit. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Why wouldn't it be? And right it's right here. there. <laughs> I'm right here. <laughs> <laughs> well, this had to be interesting. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it always is, right? <laughs> right. I feel like that book has stalked me some since I was um, on a couple of episodes of the series Hellier. I don't know if you're familiar with that or not. I am familiar. I haven't seen the more recent ones. That's exciting. Yeah, I'm in episode seven and nine of season two doing hypnosis experiments. And okay. of course, they lean heavy into some Book of the Law stuff with the code that like deciphers some shit in there. It's 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 strange <laughs> yeah that's fantastic that's such a fun show oh it is yeah, oh, yeah i and, really enjoyed it and yeah. great people too <laughs> oh, there is. all right there's no strategy to this part i'm, look, I'm watching <laughs> <laughs> flipping this is like the shuffling part with my cards okay yeah okay oh there is. And i'm How revealing your secrets find his way Back to writing the book that he was working on. Yeah. From the book of the law. <clears throat> <laughs> Trees with blossoms glittering and lucid. These kingdoms of fairy has such jewels. To him who tastes them in his nostrils, to their acolyte and slave, they must seem as if the dew of the breath of some great demon of immensity were frozen by the cold of space upon his beard. All right. All I'll right. Have to think about that. Yes, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> so this is actually from the cocaine uh, essay, which is at the end of my copy of Book of the Law. So nice. <laughs> there you have it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Oh. oh, great, mighty spirits! I'm not doing cocaine to get the back. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure that that's what's being suggested. <laughs> no. Although it's interesting that fairies came up because when I stopped writing. It was on the part where you may encounter fairies as being the cause of a haunting hmm. where I stopped writing. That's just where I, ha that's just happens to be where the cursor was blinking when I got COVID. Fascinating. <laughs> and there was also the uh, imagery of like this person, like being frozen, like there was like frost in their beard. And that yeah. reminds me of like this kind of uh, the paralysis that uh, creative blocks can kind of feel like. Yeah, I do have a lot of white hair in my goatee these days. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was fun. Thank you. That was no that was a lot of fun. Yeah, I I dig it. Um, do you offer like divination services professionally or anything like that? Uh, no, I mean I do them for my Patreon. Like everybody that subscribes to my Patreon can have a bibliomancy break, and I'll record it, and send them like an MP3 of it. But I don't really do it professionally. That's, that's I guess fun. if people wanted yeah. me to, I would. But I never <laughs> yeah. really considered it, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. How much is divination a part of like just your practice in general for your own insights? Um, well, I definitely have a daily divination practice that I do. I like to pull like a tarot card, a Lenormand card, and a rune and kind of take the three of them together as a sort of picture. Um, I, I do like to do ovomancy too. It's kind of like a, a way of scrying in my egg as it cooks. Yeah. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I've I would heard say... you talk about the egg before. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very into them. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, divination is definitely uh, a a leg of the stool of my practice, I guess. Awesome. I dig it. Um, when I was looking through your show notes with the last episode you had with Aiden, I was looking for, you know, links and ways to research more into who you are and what you do. And I noticed at the bottom of that, you've got this thing where it just says resist. And then you have this list of things. 
sovereignty of self, love of self, fierce loyalty to love and pleasure, radical kindness, path to better times. Let's break those down a little bit. I'm not sure I've heard you really discuss those anywhere. And if you have, I haven't found it yet. So my turn. Sovereignty of self. What do you mean when you talk about that? Oh, okay. Well, let me just give you a little bit of context before we like break it down. Cause I, I love this question. Thank you for asking. You're um, welcome. So this is part of, <laughs> uh, this is the statement of resistance for the green mushroom project, uh-huh. which is a sort of large scale group working, um, hypho sigil hypho means web. So we've got the sigil, we've created the, the, the network with it. And we're sort of working from there to, uh, achieve a few different objectives, like building community and empowering people within that community towards the sort of goal of being able to have this kind of solidarity against some of the gross things that we see come up in occultism, like, you know, things like uh, white supremacy stuff or what other mm-hmm. things. Um, and also just this idea of how can magic help us connect and help nourish us? The idea that Um, trees and fungi often form symbiotic relationships is kind of symbolically important to this. Um, In forests, there's often a mycelial network underground, which connects all of the trees and allows them to communicate in interesting ways. It's, it's from an ecological standpoint, it's incredibly fascinating, but sort of working with that symbology, the idea is that this, hypho sigil this web is like that mycelial network that connects us the practitioners which are the stand of trees tended together in this unseen magical way so the statement of resistance is part of that um it's kind of the idea um i would say that sovereignty of self here would be contextualized as sort of what i mentioned earlier don't listen to anybody (laughs) but yours i mean don't necessarily accept the truth claims of authority, like, you know, be, be your own. Uh, I don't, I don't want to get too platonic with it, but be your own philosopher King. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, have, have that space, like keep that space for yourself and be in charge of that space. Um, I mean, re- resisting by and, and loving yourself enough to do that because it does take a lot of self love to be able to hold that space for yourself when there's a lot of um, suggestions that this might not be the best way to go, that there's all kinds of um, pushings and pullings that go on in terms of like where we stand. And so to be able to try to stand on your own firm ground is sort of part of that, I think. Um, So, and also the idea of maintaining like loyalty to love and pleasure, like doing what you, what feels good to you, what you love, um, not being motivated by anger or by hatred or, I mean, uh, other people can, yeah, and those things are perfectly fine motivations and stuff, but like to, to maintain like loyalty to love and pleasure I think is the most that that's like the most nourishing way to keep yourself strong to like hold this ground. Um, it's this sort of idea of morale, I think, is so important. It really, it really can't be underestimated. So I think that that's part of that, like keeping that, keeping one's own morale high, um, resisting with acts of radical kindness. You know, finding these ways to. to do a thing that you would, that you think might be possible that, that you wouldn't necessarily maybe do. Um, you know, as magic users, we can sometimes see situations that we could improve with magic and the idea that you don't have to like always, you know, keep to your own like prescribed set of things. Like you can do these acts of radical kindness to try to help your community or whatever. Um, whatever that looks like for you. And uh, yes, the idea of like focusing on the path to better times. Um, I'm sure that through being familiar with Aiden's work, you can understand like the idea of how important like looking at where you want to go is. 
mm-hmm. if we're if we're like riding our our little bicycles down the road of life and we're like focused on all the trees on either side like all these potential hazards and problems like we're going to run into that like you have to focus on the path to be able to get where you're going so yeah that's the statement of resistance i really like it i i got to tell you i i saw that and i was like how do i sign up right <laughs> um hell yeah the green mushroom thing like can anybody take part in this how does that work yeah, anybody can take part in it. Um, the easiest way to hook up with the project is just to do some art or work with the sigil. Um, so that it was designed to be an inroad for people to magic who are new to it too. So um, it's supposed to be very, very accessible. So all you really need to do to hook up with it is, as I said, to just work with it. Um, there's a lot of information on the show notes for my show um, about it. Like there's, there's all kinds of different things that we've done. We've run some remote group rituals together. We have an astral space that is associated with the project that we are doing experiments in. Um, There's a few different guided meditations that people have written involving it. So yeah, to get involved, uh, check out my show, hit me up. We're also organizing the project on uh, my good friends at the faith blind council podcast. They have a discord server which is definitely one of the most chill places on the internet. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that is uh, where you can find us. If you are curious about hanging out, we do a chat every Friday night for Fungal Friday, where we just kind of hang out and talk about our practice and the project and make dick jokes and stuff and you know, <laughs> just have a good time. <laughs> so- <laughs> God damn it. Daniel Ferran, Nordic Mythology Podcast says, every show will have a dick joke no matter what you watch or hear. <laughs> Motherfucker. <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fine. Um, so yeah, well, definitely did- check it out. Everybody is welcome. And um, the only thing is that I should mention, we did build some countermeasures in, in case anybody wants to try to like do weird, like just, yeah, don't be a dick. Just don't, don't mm-hmm. like use the thing for anything other than, what it's intended for like don't i don't know people are weird so we had to we had to we wanted it to be safe for new people so we built in several countermeasures and stuff so yeah i get that yeah that's that kind of captures the heart of uh inclusive heathenry side note we wanted to make it safe for everyone (laughs) to enter into the practice not that it's a safe thing to enter into work with spirits and whatnot that's always has this degree of risk Mm -hmm. but safe to enter um i like it it this project I was so excited when I was reading it because it, it works hand in hand with a project I launched years ago. And I, I relaunched it a couple years ago on my blog for, for the show. And I called it Operation Bazaar. And it was inspired by when I was read the Illuminatus trilogy for the umpteenth time, actually. One of my and, favorites. <laughs> right? I figured. Um, and all the thought was is that you could create some sort of sigil and place it on a penny. A sigil that's meant to open up people around it to the mysteries more perhaps it will increase spirit activity maybe it will just make weird shit happen more often or make people feel suddenly uplifted in an area whatever it happens to be and go drop these pennies in public places and the idea being that pennies are so invisible in the world that the sigil will be seen and unseen and forgotten just as quickly it it will dip so fast into the viewer's subconscious that it can be activated and it's been a fun experiment over the last several years i i get random reports back every once in a while of people doing these things so i'm going to adapt this project into the green mushroom project and see what happens there oh yeah i love that i'm so excited i can't wait to hear more yeah, very this cool is, this is gonna be fun i encourage all of you listening to join into this this green mushroom project it sounds like a lot of fun i had a chance to dig into it a little bit it is exactly the kind of thing that i think we all should be doing practicing magic more not always reading about magic fuck yeah i totally agree (laughs) (laughs) i think there's i mean reading is fantastic i i don't get me wrong i'm again i'm surrounded by books but there is a lot of diminishing (laughs) returns in in terms of like how much you'll read and how much you'll practice uh, mm-hmm. At some point, you're going to have to put the book down and go actually do the thing if you want to learn how to do it. Right. 
fun question I'm pulling out of the Patreon portion and throwing into the regular show more often because I just love what it creates. Tell me about a time when you use magic to get yourself or someone else out of serious trouble. (laughs) Trying to think here. (laughs) Or any kind of trouble for that matter. (laughs) I mean... I think again the the first the first thing I and I don't want to go into too much detail here, but the first thing I told you about when I realized that magic was true, I think I definitely got myself out of some serious trouble there. Oh yeah, um, okay. But like, yeah, there's because there been there's been so many times I'm having a hard time like <laughs> nailing it down. I mean, yeah. there's pick been the, pick the more fun one, I guess. Right? Okay, okay. Um, <laughs> I don't want to know about the time you use it to get away with murder. I want to hear about the police chase. Well, if I told you about that, I would have to kill you. Oh. <laughs> um, okay, recently I was going to be um, giving an interview that was really important to me. And my internet went down. And I said, hey... Um, I need the internet. To, it's it's been very bad recently, and I, I was like, I need the internet to to stay on this whole time that the that the interview will be going on. So I, I don't know if that's serious trouble. That that happened recently. That's the first thing that came <laughs> to mind. There's been several times when divinations have done this, where I've you know I've gotten that feeling before taking an action, like ooh maybe I should like do a quick divination and see what's up. If you ever get that feeling obviously please listen to your gut and do it um because there's been several times where i'm like oh oh shit and then like later on seeing that play out like oh that would have been very very bad like that Mm -hmm. i think a lot of times um it has been in terms of like avoiding uh potential dangerous or uh bad situations okay yeah i dig it um let's go a completely different route the standard question that everyone gets asked, especially the ma- magical practitioners on this show. Have you ever experienced a haunting? I do not think so. Oh, wah, wah, wah. I know. Yeah, I was actually going. <laughs> this was something I was going to ask you because I and maybe again, maybe it's because I'm a social and because. Like I, I would like to have more interactions like that, but it doesn't seem to like happen very often to me. The, at least maybe, may, or maybe I just am too thick-headed to realize that it's happening. That is very probable, actually. Um, I'm curious if you have any advice about how one could like open themselves up to experiences like that. I would say you're probably already open to such experiences. Just guessing. I think. For me, anyway, that the first act of magic is akin to turning a light on on the porch on the other side. Like all the neighbors that didn't know you lived there thought the house was empty. No, you're there now. You know, it's like being a made man in a mafia. You can't leave. They all know who you are. Hmm. So it's up to you to start to acquire the skills to protect yourself, to get in contact, to increase those, you know, those practices. Um in the process of that, I think the more we work magic, we become embodiments of what the crossroads is. That people think of the crossroads magically as the place where you go and make the offerings, where you can encounter the spirits, where you can open the gates, where you have this direct access to the other world. I think that's precisely what practicing magic regularly will do to you, is turn you into a living avatar in a way of the crossroads. So one thing I do in my practice is like consecrate myself as the crossroads every day. I center myself that way and I recognize it. Um, Beyond that, it's a matter of place and timing. It's a great degree of luck um, and being clear on what it is managing, I guess, managing expectations. So considering the field hauntings are the places in my theory where the field is entangled between our world and other worlds that those things aren't so clear and they sort of get this spiral force of energy that ebbs and flows. And perhaps it ebbs greater when 
ravens fly by or, you know, certain or mushrooms are present more or, you know, it, it may not have anything to do with people at all. And, and why aren't you experiencing more? Probably because you're not going to the right places. And that doesn't mean you need, hey, you need to go find the old abandoned crazy house. Maybe you're not recognizing the experiences you've had. If you work with spirits or anything like that, I mean, you had some experience that got you in contact with <clears throat> what you're calling the love and war goddess, right? That's a, on the spectrum of spirit activity. That's along the bigger side of the spectrum, right? That's a haunting in a way, because a haunting is nothing more than experiencing the strange. Um, it be, gets a bad reputation because people are scared. They don't know what to do. You're a magic user. You're not scared. You're curious. <laughs> you know? Okay. Well, so I'm, what I'm hearing is that the problem is, is that my definition of haunting is not the one that other people are using. <laughs> No, because not I'm so much. I'm thinking about like, you know, uh, like poltergeist stuff and everything's going wild, like Skinwalker yeah. Ranch. Like, no, I haven't <laughs> seen that happen in my <laughs> I want to. <laughs> like, in all yeah. fairness, I haven't seen that kind of crazy shit go down either. Okay. Um, and I think there's a lot of reasons for that. One, I think it's incredibly rare. Two, um, again, think of it more along the lines of what is entangled in the field. So if you want poltergeist activity, like the outright crazy kind of shit going on, consider what it might look like on the other side. If we were to cross over, you know, if it, you don't have the clue on, you, you should get clues on this side of what it looks like, but you may not. Um, but I, I've found over the years of experiments and research that you're, you're going to, let's say if you were, walking down the street and you look down an alley and you see a biker bar down there and you see all the Harleys out there and you hear the loud music, the smell of cigarettes and alcohol coming out of it. If you were to flip to the other side in that place, you're going to see a certain environment, a certain kind of spirit that's attracted to it and so on. Same thing with these old abandoned asylums and prisons that are everywhere. There's a reason they encounter more strange activity. I think in those places, that are mischief related because these are places that attract those sorts of spirits. You see where I'm going with this? Yeah, totally. So, yeah. What kind of encounter do you want to have? You want to have the batshit crazy encounter? Well, start looking around the world where you think those kind of spirits might be attracted. That's <laughs> great advice. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> proceed accordingly. <laughs> yeah. And I'm thinking now too, yeah. like, yeah, it must just be a definitional thing. Cause I'm as, as you pointed out, Liz, yes, there have been, encounters i guess i just never contextualize them as being hauntings so <laughs> yes. yeah well as as magic using people we don't think of it that way we think of it as spirit contact spirit communication we make offerings to our ancestors our allies we're swimming in spirits all the time right we're as about as haunted as haunted could get <laughs> we're just asking for them to bless us with good fortune good health guide us protect us we don't ever ask them turn the doorknob, flip my lights on and off, fuck with the TV. <laughs> That's a but great maybe point. You should, but maybe you should. <laughs> That's a great point. <laughs> well, you know, yeah. I actually, that, that's, that's a great point because I did, I did ask for something like that. I was like, could you give me a sign please to like, let me know that I'm actually doing this right. And that you're into it. You know, could you, could you do And And the thing was, and I, it was, so I guess, you know, that I think that that's an example of, of that actually. Hell yeah. Yeah. So yeah, someday I'll write, I'm, I'm starting to feel a direction that needs to be addressed in my book. Maybe I needed this conversation to get over that block. Okay. Hell yeah. <laughs> We are unfreezing the beard. Fuck you, Crowley. <laughs> Fuck you, Crowley. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So going from that, speaking of places, um, every place has got like its local legends and folklore, really cool places of power and so on. So a place where you've lived, um, what's one of your favorites? Oh, man, there's so many. I think that one of the places that I found to be really like spiritually powerful and special was Santa Fe. Um, I went to school like in the sort of like the outskirts um, for a little while of the city, um, sort of like right where the, the little mountains start. And there was just this really powerful, um, this sort of like high and dry 
I think Aiden mentioned it, this sort of clear feeling of like that, that clarity. Mm -hmm. Um, I I thought that that was really amazing. Uh, I had a really cool encounter there with this like giant white spider that was just like, um, spiders have always been kind of a, a totem animal for me. And it was just this really kind of cool, uh, experience of like, I've just seen, I don't, I've never seen another one like it, but it was just this huge tarantula that had these long white hairs. It was just this like gorgeous, fuzzy giant spider that uh, appeared to me uh, when I was up there meditating in the woods and stuff. And <laughs> so, yeah, it's just little, little cool things like that. Uh, no, I dig it. Very cool. Um, I guess we're getting close to the end of the usual time. So if I haven't covered something that you want to talk about, here's a good place to put it in. You got anything going on people need to know? Well, we've talked about the Green Mushroom Project, which I probably would have mentioned here otherwise. Um, <laughs> no, not really. I mean, other yeah, other than my uh, my work with that and, and my podcasts and stuff like that, I've got some kind of like side projects going on but those aren't like out yet or i'm not sure if they'll ever be (laughs) so (laughs) probably not (laughs) worth mentioning here (laughs) (laughs) all right so um where can people find you um well you can find me on instagram at luxacult pod and you can also check out my stuff at the mimetic disease which is a sort of like art magic mashup bullshit thing i've been doing um, those are probably the easiest ways to find me. And also you could check out the Luxacult podcast um, if you want to hear about the intersections of science and art and magic and philosophy through chaos magic. Um, and you could check out my other shows, uh, Smuts Up and Ad Hoc History, too. Oh, sounds fun. I have not I have not checked out Smuts Up. Brilliant name. I dig it. <laughs> <laughs> it's an incredibly <laughs> cringy sex comedy. I don't necessarily recommend it, but... It's kind of an exercise that um, a few of my friends and I are doing um, to try to whittle away at a lot of the like shame that surrounds how we our culture like approaches sexuality um, and sort of like making these ideas a little bit more accessible and like less scary to um, general population. Okay, yeah, not a bad project to have. Um... And ad hoc history, that's, you do that with your brother, correct? I do, yeah. My brother yeah. Asher and I make that. Um, he's a huge history buff, and I want to learn more about history. So the combination of that is very fun, and we have a great time making it. Awesome. So quick um, ad hoc history. It's not just a recounting of dates and times and names. You, it's stories, correct? Yeah, yeah. We like to look at the sort of like motivation behind what these people and these epic stories like might have been what might what might have laid behind like these crazy things that have happened and you know what would it be like to be this emperor or this general or whatever and and what must have felt like that to you know to be in this position and and how does that how does like what we see in history um play out again in our in our modern times you know the idea of of fractals and iteration i mean as we said earlier it's kind of a ubiquitous thing and i think that history is one place where you can see it you can see these things sort of reiterating again and again and it might not be the same but it rhymes so -hmm. i think it's a really cool uh and useful thing to do yeah i will be checking that one out again soon um currently going through your entire archives and it's been a fantastic trip. I invite all my listeners to join me. If you've not found the Luxacult podcast yet, I promise you're missing out. So please, please, please go check that out and become a Patreon member while you're at it. Thank, well, thank you, you so-, so. Oh yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say thank you so much. I really appreciate. Uh, yeah, I super appreciate you listening and uh, saying all that nice shit. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> saying all that nice shit. All right. So. Uh, thank you again for being here. It's been wonderful getting a chance to talk to you and everyone out there listening. Thank you for uh, checking out the show. Speaking of Patreon, if you'd like to hear the rest of this conversation where we talk about more weird shit and see what happens, stealing a phrase from earlier in the show, you'll have to go to weirdwebradio.com and click join the membership or go to patreon.com slash weirdwebradio and become a member. 
I just want to say real quick that um, it's a huge honor to be here, especially when I look at the amazing guests that you've talked to. Uh, to be in such company is a huge honor. So thank you so much. Oh, it, it's perfectly fine. And to be in that lineup, you absolutely have, you've earned your place. I stole this phrase directly from Meredith Graves. No experts. I heard her talking about it on another show. It was, she was absolutely right. And this idea of no experts, you talked about it. You know, you are your own authority, self sovereignty. It matters. So what a great note to end this episode on, right? You belong <laughs> here. That's all I'm saying. And it's been great to get a chance to talk to you. So thank you again, everybody out there listening. Stay weird. <laughs> now it's bonus audio time. For all the Patreon peeps, are you ready? Yes, I am ready. All right, Lux Estrada. First question around this place is always the same for the first trip, anyway. <laughs> what person's fame or what famous person's resting place do you most want to visit? Ooh. Do you want to hear how they just answered that question? What famous person's resting place would you most like to visit? That and many others, including what they think about the afterlife, what they may or may not do in cemeteries, what are their traditions and magical practices that have to do with the dead, folklore that surrounds their homes, and so much more, available for only $5. $5 a month. Even if I make more than one episode in a month, it's still just $5 a month at patreon.com slash weirdwebradio or go to weirdwebradio.com and click join the membership you can find me on instagram at weirdwebradio you can find me on facebook as weirdwebradio or come join the new fun and exciting weirdwebradio facebook group thank you again for being here stay weird out there my friends (laughs) 